Hey, it's Leo for Actualized.org. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about understanding default positions. This concept of the default position is an extremely foundational and critical concept, which you need to understand because in all the future stuff that I talk about, this will keep recurring. This concept will keep coming back and back and back into the big picture of things. And I want you to know what this concept means, what default position means, so that when I say that in the future, you can be like, oh yeah, that's exactly what he talked about before, and I can see how that fits into the larger picture and all the different examples of how this works. So what is a default position? Let me give you a couple of ways to think about it. One way to think about it is, it's a position that you hold, or a person holds, without acknowledging that it's a position. Also, it's a natural position requiring no burden of proof. Or you could think of it as an overlooked assumption or a belief that one holds without knowing that it's a belief that one holds. Or you could think of it as a perspective that one has which masquerades as actuality and denies that it's just a perspective. So, as you can tell here, we're going down into some epistemology, theory of knowledge. Again and again, we keep coming back to this topic of epistemology because it ends up being so critical to uh, understanding the obstacles that keep you stuck in life. That's why we keep coming back to it, and we keep looking at it from different perspectives. In philosophy also, there's this notion when people argue or debate or use reasoning to try to make some sort of progress, intellectual progress, there's this notion that some positions deserve a sort of default status. By which we mean that like, well, a certain position is just sort of obviously true or it just seems more true on the face of it than other positions and therefore, it doesn't require as high a burden of proof. And so it's like the crazy, wacky positions, the oddball positions, those are the ones that require a lot of proof. But then there's these, like, these default positions, which are just obvious to everybody, and they don't require much proof, and they're rather safe. This is a notion that I want to debunk here. This is a very dangerous notion. And the way we're going to do this is with some examples. In fact, I'm going to give you a lot of examples here, but I want to focus on three specific examples which I've identified as being just like the uh, epitome of what I mean by default position and also the danger of not recognizing default positions that you hold. So perhaps the best of these is atheism. Even though I'm going to rag on atheists here, um, basically I consider myself an atheist. I was an atheist pretty much my whole life. I was never religious or theistic in any kind of sense. But uh, I did study, because I was an atheist, I did study atheism in a lot of depth, and I observed it within myself, and I found some, uh, some things that most atheists don't find, and that most atheists would find very um, unpalatable if they really explored the full depth of atheism. So, atheists like to position themselves as having no position. And they like to say, well, Leo, atheism is not a position. The religious people, the theists, they're the ones who believe in stuff, and therefore they have a position. Whereas I, as an atheist, don't believe in, in any of that kind of stuff, and therefore it's not really even right to call me an atheist, because that would be like just putting a label on me. In fact... I just don't buy into these silly notions of God or other deities or supernatural phenomena. I just don't buy into any of that kind of stuff. In the same way that maybe like, you know, a religious person doesn't buy into the spaghetti monster, the flying spaghetti monster. And so in that sense, the religious person is also an atheist, but with respect to the flying spaghetti monster. And so in that sense, 
uh, I have no position. Not so fast. To truly have no position is a very different thing than what your typical atheist is doing. You also have to make a distinction between not having a position in theory and then also what actually happens in practice. Because it's very easy to create a rift between the two. And to say, for example, well, yeah, in theory I have no position. But then in practice you actually do have a position. And your position is revealed most truly by your emotions and your behaviors and your attitudes and your dispositions towards people things and the way that you relate to life as a whole that speaks much more much more about your true position than your intellectual philosophical ruminations and the sort of armchair philosophy that you would do or the way that you debate maybe with a friend you see so the atheist likes to say that he has no position. Actually, he does have a position. If he's very honest and looks within, he'll see that he actually has an active belief there. And the active belief is that there is no God. That is the active belief. Which is why, of course, we have um, another word to contrast atheists with theists, and that is agnostics. You might say, okay, Leo, so what you're talking about here is agnosticism. Agnosticism would be like the true form of atheism in the sense that the agnostic really doesn't know. He admits that, well, I can't know one way or another. But you see, even that is a position. Even the agnostic, most agnostics like to think of themselves as agnostic, but that's agnosticism in theory. In practice, they're not really agnostic. They still hold a position. Because if we take the typical agnostic person and we like ask them to maybe consider Christianity and then atheism, they'll say, well, it's a wash. I don't really know. Maybe there is a God. Maybe there's a heaven. Maybe there's not. Maybe there's uh, just nothing. Maybe there's just reality, the Big Bang, whatever. And he, he kind of holds them as, as equal. That's what the typical agnostic does. But then if we say, okay, but do you like believe in Mormonism? Do you hold it as equal as these two? He'll probably say no. Or if we say, well, what about Scientology? Do you hold that as equal as these? Say no. And even if he doesn't say no, in practice, if he hears about Scientology or something like that, he'll just have a gut reaction to say, no, that's just a bunch of shit. I'm not going to even entertain that. You see, that's the true position there. That reveals what agnosticism really is. The atheist actually has an active belief that there is no God. I know because I've held this active belief. I've kind of... Uh, been on both sides of the fence on this issue, right? So this is what I mean by a default position, is what the atheist is doing, is that he's saying, no, Leo, I have no position. You don't understand. But that actually is a position. You actually do have a position. You're just not conscious of it. You're not conscious of your position. And you also hold it as a default in the sense that whenever you're debating with theistic people, you say, well you guys believe in some sort of God, therefore, and I don't, therefore, I am like the minimalist here, let's go with Occam's razor, I'm the minimalist, my position doesn't require any proof, any, there's no high burden of proof for my position to clear as an atheist, whereas for you as a theist, there's a high position, uh, a high burden of proof to, to overcome in order to, to believe in God. Now, this might sound like I'm arguing in favor of theism. Don't make that mistake. I'm just trying to make you more aware of how default positions work. I'm not interested here in reconciling or debating between one uh, ideology and another. I'm interested in going much deeper than that. So that's the example with, uh, with atheism. I'll give you another example of default positions, which is the... Uh, the the notion of um, not the notion rather but the mindset that most people have about psychedelics this is very interesting because um, this is one I only learned recently in the last year as I started talking about psychedelics to to ordinary people after having used them and it was very uh, interesting for me the reactions quite honestly I was quite shocked at some of the reactions I got 
from uh, my viewers and also from other people that I've that I've talked to um, kind of more privately about this this topic. If you take the average person who has not actually done any psychedelics and you start talking to them about psychedelics and some of the amazing revelations that are possible, like the mystical experiences that are possible and various deep existential insights and so forth, even when you get past their very common uh, negative reaction just to, to psychedelics in general because psychedelics are lumped in with other drugs, hard drugs, and so in general there's just sort of like stigma around psychedelics um, just from a kind of cultural perspective because we've been tr taught in school not to do drugs and and that drugs are evil and bad and they'll just destroy your life. So there's that whole element. But even if you set that issue aside and you get someone who's quite open-minded and then you start talking to them about psychedelics and some of these mystical experiences, they'll say, well, yeah, okay, Leo, yeah, you were talking about some of these uh, amazing mystical experiences and I'll admit maybe psychedelics do give you some of these amazing mystical experiences, but how do you know they're not just hallucinations? They're just like a hallucination. You want me to take this psychedelic, but what's going to be the point? Because I'm just going to be like whisked out of this reality into some dream or some fantasy, and it's just going to be an illusion. I'm just going to come back to ordinary reality, and then ordinary reality is just going to continue the way it always has. So why should I even bother with that? Do you see the default position there, though? The default position of your typical person about psychedelics who hasn't tried them is that they assume that this right here is the actual reality. That's a huge fucking assumption. Huge assumption. They think that this right here is the real reality and that wherever you go there is just a dream. But consider the converse of that that this here is the dream and that wherever you go might be more real than the dream you're in right now you see that's the default position there and it's very subtle and it's very hard to see this default position uh, until you've actually exited it first so once you take the psychedelic you'll often immediately very quickly recognize oh my god that was my default position and I held it for, for years, for years, for years. Why didn't I try this earlier? I didn't even anticipate that such a reversal was possible, you see. And that's exactly what happens when you hold a default, default position without recognizing that it's a position. You uh, open yourself up to some big surprises and some very big epistemic blunders because... Um, it could be revealed to you in an instant under the right circumstances that what you held as reality just a moment before was actually a conceptual position that you had. See? Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to my mom about psychedelics and I, I, I wanted her to try it because there's some amazing experiences and I think it would actually help her to grow and to get some healing done. But... Uh, even though she's not close, totally close-minded about psychedelics, she doesn't want to try it. She doesn't want to, why not? Because she doesn't recognize that she's holding the default position that this here is not a hallucination. She's like, well, yeah, psychedelics will just cause me to hallucinate. I don't want to hallucinate. I want to be in reality. But this, what is this here? This is a hallucination right here. I don't just mean that metaphorically. I mean it literally. And that's what psychedelics will reveal to you, literally. So if she ever takes a psychedelic, she will instantly know the error of her epistemic reasoning. But of course, the tragedy of it is that because of the error of the epistemic reasoning, she will probably never ever take a psychedelic and never be able to correct the situation. That's the irony of this whole thing. That's why I'm stressing this so much, because this stuff is so pernicious. It traps you so completely in the illusion. And the third final example, that I, the really strong example that I want to give to you of default positions, is death. Now, this one can really blow a lot of people's minds. Death is a default position that you hold. You actually believe that you will die. 
you see. You actually believe you will die, and you probably have specific beliefs about what you think will happen at death. So you will either think that nothing happens, you just kind of go asleep into a dark nothingness. Probably if you're an atheist, you believe something like that. Or if you're more spiritually inclined, you'll probably think that your soul floats off to somewhere, to some purgatory, or to heaven, or to hell, or to some other dimension or some other realm, and something like that happens. Maybe you think you'll, you'll meet God, maybe you think you'll become enlightened by dying. You know, you have some kind of ideas about what's going to happen at death. It's not the case, notice, that it is not the case that you have no opinions about death whatsoever. My claim is that not only do you have theoretical beliefs about death, but also you have very practical ones. In the sense that if I take a loaded revolver and I stick it to your temple and I am about to pull the trigger and you think that I'm going to pull that trigger, there's going to be a whole set of emotional, physiological, mental reactions going on with you. And they will be very sharp. They will not be subtle. Which betrays your belief in death. You see. You are not neutral or agnostic about death. You actually believe that death will happen and that it'll probably be a negative thing. You don't want it to happen. And you probably believe something about how it's going to happen and what's going to be on the other end. Even though you might have a little a little bit of uh, sort of open-mindedness in that you might say well yeah we don't really know we don't really know yeah but you behave when I put a gun to your head you behave as though you really know you behave as though it's a bad thing you're not wishy-washy about it when there's a gun to your head or to your child's head you see now you might say <laughs> well Leo death yeah death I mean we all die so what's the default position there? No, you see, death is a, a default position. That's a belief. That's a conceptualization. This whole notion of death is a specific position that you hold. And notice that you hold a second order position on top of the first order position. And the second order position says something along the lines of, um, there's not even an alternative. There's not even a possibility. It would be ridiculous and silly to think that I don't die. Under what circumstances could I not die? How is that even possible? It makes no sense. Death is really the only option. Now, how I'm going to die and what exactly is going to be at the other end of that, I don't really know. But that death will happen is certain. So, let me be very clear here. What I'm saying is that that death will happen to you is not certain at all. And that that's a position that you hold that you've probably never seriously um, thought of as a position. You don't think of death as a perspective, you see. You hold it as a brute fact. And that's the second order part of this position is that not only do you think that death will happen to you, and that it'll happen in a specific way and the stuff will happen at the end of that, um, but you also hold that that's just a brute fact when that's not true at all, you see. Are you starting to fathom the depth and the, the crazy ramifications of really um, understanding what I'm saying? Not just in theory, but so that it, it percolates down into practice for you. you, see. Let me give you some more examples the kind of quick list of examples that I won't go into into a lot of depth because I just don't have the time of default positions. So uh, one default position is naive realism. I've talked about that at length in past episodes. Uh, another position is that everything in the universe is rational. I've also covered that in my um, what's wrong with rationality episode. Uh, another default position, very common, is that reality is made out of discrete, separate entities or objects that are physically demarcated and separate from each other as though the world is composed of objects. And that these objects are inherent and are real and are somehow absolutely defined. 
in the sense that, you know, I see a table, my children see the same table, my wife sees the same table, my cat and dog see the same table, even a robot that I create sees the same table and is able to use image recognition to, to, to locate that table and to maybe move around it successfully. And therefore, I conclude that that table actually exists as a physical separate object uh, within reality. See, that's a position that you hold that you probably never considered as a just a perspective. That's one perspective. It might not be true at all. Even though it seems like it's the only perspective. See, when you only have one perspective, it always seems like that perspective is the reality because there's nothing to contrast it against. There's no alternatives. As soon as you have two or more, at least two, that's why getting that second perspective is so critical. Once you get the second perspective, all of a sudden your mind opens up to, to the possibility of infinite perspectives. Uh, which is why a lot of religions and cults and stuff like that, they really get you to just buy into one perspective. Because if they can do that, they've got you. They've got a monopoly on your mind. And of course, this isn't just uh, religions and cults. Science, culture, society, nutrition, um, business theory, military strategy. Uh, you know, there's, there's a whole gamut here of, of areas in life where this happens. The position that time is absolute, that's a default position that virtually everybody held until 100 years ago, until Albert Einstein came along and, um, and said otherwise. And even now, even though Einstein and most modern physicists understand that time is not absolute, in practice, most people live their life as though time were an absolute. When it's not, we know, our best scientists know it's not, and yet we still live that way. Another default position is that energy is always conserved. This is a popular one in science, which I think eventually might be debunked by science itself. Um, anyway, it's a position, <laughs> even if it isn't going to be debunked for a long time, or maybe it maybe ends up being true, but, um, but it's still a default position in the way that it's held, because it's held as just obviously true, when in fact, there's nothing obvious about it. Another common one like that is you can't get something from nothing. How many times have you said, heard people arguing that way? Well, you can't get something from nothing. Oh yeah, how do you know? That's a default position right there. Or Occam's razor. That's a really uh, a terrible default position. There's no reason why uh, explanations of reality have to be simple. They could be as complex as uh, reality itself. Skepticism especially false skepticism, as I've talked about in prior episodes, is commonly held as a default position. You think like, well, most skeptics think like, well, questioning everything and doubting everything, that's, that's just natural. That's just like what we're supposed to be doing. Without recognizing that maybe by doubting everything, you actually delude yourself. So that's a, you know, the problem with false skepticism is that you take the position that all other positions are false except the one that you took. Leads to a lot of delusion. Uh, the position that modern science is true because it works. That's a very pervasive modern default position. People are so bought into science and technology and to the benefits of it that um, they never really question this. And then this creates a... <laughs> A lot of damage. The default position that consciousness is in the brain. Probably 99% of the world's populations believe this. If not explicitly, then implicitly. Right? You believe that your consciousness is tied to your brain. And any belief other than that sounds ridiculous. People really think like, no, but that consciousness happens in the brain and is a brain process, that that is just a given, you know? There's no burden of proof that that has to clear. If you want to leave, if you want to argue that consciousness is somehow outside the brain or separate from the brain, 
or independent of the brain, you need to provide very good proof for that. See, that's the trap that I'm pointing to you here. That you are the body is another default position. That you believe you're this physical body. Another one is that physical pain has to inherently be painful and that it's bad. That's a default position that many people hold. That you have free will or control over life and yourself and your circumstances. This is a very common default position. What's funny about this one is that even people who do not believe in free will, people who are determinists, people who will argue against free will, in theory, in practice, they will still believe in free will. In practice, they will still feel that they are the controller and doer of life. Because that's what ego is about. You see? So it's very, it's very interesting the kind of rifts that the mind can create between the theory and the practice. And what's more important is the practice rather than the theory. Most determinists are actually firm believers in free will because they act as though they have it. When they lose control over some circumstance in their life, they get upset. See, if you actually believed you didn't have free will, you would not be upset about a situation where you have no control. You would be surrendered to it. But that's a very rare state of affairs. Very few people are actually surrendered to those kinds of, in those kinds of, you know, tough situations. When I put a gun to your head, you're probably not going to be surrendered to that. You're probably going to, you know, try to attack me. Of course, even if you did attack me, that would still not be uh, <laughs> evidence of a free will. You attack me because I put a gun to your head. In the same way that, <laughs> you know, a, a robot can attack you when you <laughs> um, try to unplug it from the wall or something. You could easily program a robot to attack a human being. It doesn't prove that it has free will. Uh, another default position is a, a, a lot of the mainstream cultural norms that we have. So like getting married, if you believe that you need to get married or you have a certain pressure or feeling like I need to get married, that's a default position you have. You probably have default positions about sexuality. For example, you probably believe homosexuality is maybe unnatural or unmanly. And you might say, Leo, how could you say homosexuality is, how could it possibly be manly? Of course it's unmanly. Right, that's your default position, you see. You never bothered to ask for proof for that position. You just took it on faith. You took it as just a given. See, that's the danger of the default position is that it just sort of slides under the radar of examination. And it never gets examined because it just feels too obvious to be examined. That's what all these examples have in common, is that they just feel so obvious when you are holding these positions. And on the other hand, when you're not holding these positions, they seem so ridiculously blind, so unconscious. Another position is uh, that the education system teaches truth. A lot of people believe that. Another position is that enlightenment is an experience that one has. Watch out for that one. Enlightenment is not an experience. Watch out for that one. Um, another default position is nihilism. The idea that life is inherently bleak and meaningless and hopeless and depressing and sad and just full of suffering. This is a position. The nihilist's mistake is that he doesn't recognize that nihilism itself is just a groundless default position that he stumbled into and now doesn't know how to escape uh, if you struggle with depression, watch out for this default position, which is that most people who are depressed hold that depression is something that happens to them, like cancer or something. It's just a play upon me. Whereas the alternative to that is maybe that depression is something that you're causing, something that you're doing actively. Depression must be actively maintained. Most depressed people have the default position that no, depression is the default state. Like, unless I'm always cheering myself up, I'm going to be depressed. 
That's their default position. It happens to be false as well. Actually, peace and bliss are more of the default state for the human system, for a healthy human conscious system, rather than depression. Depression is something you're actively creating all the time. You're just not aware how you're creating it. But you can become aware. And that ends up being the ultimate solution to depression, not pills. You might have a default position like letting my kids watch TV or playing with the iPad all day isn't really bad for them. It's okay. No problems. And if you do hold that position, it's probably not explicit. It's not like you go around telling your friends like, oh yeah, it's okay for my kids to watch a bunch of TV and play a bunch of games on the iPad all the time. It's okay. You never probably explicitly say it to anybody, not even to yourself, do you acknowledge this position unless you really go in there and start to look. Another very common default position, which is uh, leading to a lot of problems, is this, this one about humanity. That humanity is somehow highly evolved and that we have exited the dark ages. Maybe not. Another default position is that society is healthy. And this is another one that's totally under the radar. Most people in society believe that society is healthy. Of course, because if they believed otherwise, they would not really be able to, to function as a cog in the machine that society is. One of the biggest eye-opening <laughs> mind fucks of all when you start to get into this deep self-actualization work is you start to see more and more just how dysfunctional and how unhealthy society is. And it blows your mind. It's like, wow, it blows your mind. And it doesn't stop blowing your mind. It doesn't just happen once. It's like over and over and over and over again. It just like, it doesn't stop. Like every year I'm seeing how fucking dysfunctional society is. That's, um, that can be, uh, that can be emotionally laborious to notice that over and over again it can be kind of shocking. But most people don't recognize that. They just assume that society is healthy. I mean, this is, this is the norm. This is how society is supposed to be, right? It's not even thought about. And the last one I'll mention is the default position that happiness comes from external conditions. This is a huge default position that a lot of people hold, which really screws them up and prevents them from ever finding happiness. So um, notice that often default positions really turn out to be special case constraints. So what do I mean by this? For example, gravity. We assumed up until like 500 years ago, we generally assumed that gravity points downward and that objects fall downward. Like you can read some treatises from the Greeks and Romans and um, they, they actually believe that objects have an inherent tendency to fall down. That's what their explanation of gravity was. Until, of course, Newton came along and then we went into outer space and we saw that actually gravity is uh, omnidirectional. It doesn't just favor stuff falling down. That just is a special constraint upon gravity when you're you know, dealing with a very large spherical object that looks flat and you're on, sitting on top of it. Then it appears as though, yeah, gravity is always downward. But when you're out in outer space, it doesn't look like that anymore, right? So gravity being downward is a special constraint. In the same way with Euclidean geometry, Euclid assumed that parallel lines at 90 degrees always, you know, run, can run forever and never intersect. And of course, the default position there that he was assuming that he wasn't conscious of is that that's only on a flat surface. If you're talking about a spherical or hyperbolic surface, then that's no longer true, right? So Euclidean geometry is a special constraint on uh, the larger field of possible geometries that exist. And you know now we know better because we have non-Euclidean geometry, and that's one of the um, developments that allowed Einstein to then um, revolutionize our understanding of space-time. Because space-time is four-dimensional, he you know, modeled it as four-dimensional non-Euclidean. Um, another example would be absolute time. I already kind of talked about this, but uh, you know, until Einstein, there was this notion that time is absolute. 
and it's the same for everybody. And then we find out that that's not true, that absolute time is really just a special constraint which only works for human beings when we are at relatively low speeds under the speed of light. If we go faster approaching the speed of light, then absolute time starts to break down. It doesn't really work, right? So it's sort of a simplification. So a lot of what the human mind does is make these simplifications, but then these simplifications come back to bite us in the ass because we mistake our simplifications for reality, and we think that our simplifications explain everything, when in fact, there's a lot that they don't explain. So all of these are positions. Everything I talked about above, these are all positions that are being held, often without knowing that they are being held. And a lot of times what these positions do when it's pointed out to you that it's a position is that you deny that it's a position. The position denies itself. It's not really you. It's really a position is almost like a virus infecting your mind, if you want to think about it that way. And then that virus defends itself. You see? And for the virus, the best defense mechanism is to go completely unnoticed. So it's really in the virus's favor that you're never aware that it's present at all. See, the virus is smart. The virus doesn't come out and showboat and do all this flowery stuff. I mean, sometimes it does in some people. But most of the times, your most deepest um, beliefs that get you stuck the most, they are completely unconscious to you. They are not premeditated at all. They weren't chosen by you. You don't even know that they're there until you do a lot of digging. And I want you to be really cognizant that many of the positions you think you hold in theory are actually quite different in practice. You don't just hold positions in theory. You also hold them in practice. And a lot of times there's this sort of disconnect, this rift. You want a really good example of this? of something that you actually hold in practice very, very deeply, you hold that reality is actually real. Like, think of what I'm saying here. You actually have a position, and it is a position, that this reality that you have been a part of your whole life, that it's actually real. And then you have a second order position on top of that, which says, Leo, you're fucking crazy what you're saying here, because it is real. What else is more real than reality? See, and that's something that even if you're a philosopher, you've probably never actually sat down and thought to yourself, oh, well, yeah, I have a default position that reality is real. No, not even if you're a philosopher have you probably even done that. Not unless you've gone really fucking deep, right? Because this stuff is, man, it's just, it seems so obvious. And that's exactly how it hides from you, is through its obviousness. Well, what I want you to take away from this episode is that there are no givens, Everything must be empirically investigated. And anything that's not empirically investigated, watch out. You're really setting yourself up for um, some disasters there. Disasters of very <laughs> tragic proportions. Notice, interestingly, that from a mechanical point of view, it's hard for the eye to see itself. It's hard for you to see where it is you're standing. Right? Because the place you stand is hidden by the fact that you're standing on it. You see? That's sort of like the mechanics of life. And reality is facing this problem of how does it become conscious of itself? Reality is facing this problem on many levels that you probably don't even appreciate yet. And yet it's challenging because when you identify with a thing, then you're standing on top of it, right? And then you don't really see it. It is looking out at everything else, doesn't really see itself. 
and it takes a lot of effort to circle back around to really see itself properly. This is sort of a mechanical problem. Imagine if you were an engineer trying to design an eyeball that could completely see itself from all angles, as well as the rest of the world. That would be a tricky engineering challenge. See? And you might even wonder, well, why, why, why do that? What's the point? Don't we just want the eyeball looking outward, never looking inward? Why does it need to see itself from every angle? Well, maybe for an eyeball, that's not a big problem. Although, you know, <laughs> if you have a, 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 a tiger creeping up behind you, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to see back there. You see? But for human beings who are very complex organisms, we need to be much more self-aware. Otherwise, we create all, all sorts of disasters and problems for ourselves, both individually and collectively, is because, um, you know, we don't really have a 360-degree panoramic perspective of how we behave as human beings. Mostly, we just have this tiny five-degree view out into the world which with, with which we interact and with which, to which we relate. But that ends up being um, <laughs> way too limited of a perspective. Default positions are a key mechanism for self-deception. Because what they allow is they allow the mind to make a construction, a conceptual construction, without acknowledging that it's a conceptual construction. It allows constructions to be created and then regarded by its creator as inherent to reality. This creates projections. This is how you can concoct some sort of story or whatever, almost anything you want. You can basically create a fantasy and then that fantasy becomes real for you. Now you might say, well, that's a very dangerous mechanism and it is. And you might say, well, Leo, we don't want to live in a fantasy. We want to live in just reality. But see, you got to see both sides of this because reality is very ingenious. For reality to create itself, which is what it's doing all the time, reality is creating itself. It's the only thing there is, so it has to create itself. To do that, it has to, there has to be a way for an illusion to appear like reality because that's actually what creates reality. That's actually the fabric of reality is illusion. In the same way that the substance of a magic trick is the sleight of hand. Without a sleight of hand, you could not create an amazing magic trick. And what is more amazing of a magic trick than this entire universe? You see? So there's a very deep interconnection between um, constructions getting constructed but then not being aware as constructions. That's why most people believe in all sorts of constructions, but they will never admit that they are constructions. They will argue to the death that they are reality. And another secondary component here of, of this self-deception mechanism is that um, active maintenance has to happen of these constructions, which doesn't get acknowledged. So the best example of this is with depression. A depressed person, not only will they generally not acknowledge that depression is a construction, but they will especially not want to acknowledge that they are actively maintaining their depression. They like to think that depression is just like something that they're stuck in, as if it's like the, um, the most natural state for the human being. Or nihilists think this way, right? Nihilists don't understand that they are actively maintaining their nihilism and that they could stop. So the danger here is that with these default positions, they create paradigm lock, which I've talked about in the past. They prevent self-inquiry and observation, especially self-observation. They lead to unexamined self-biases. They lead to closed-mindedness and dogmatic debating. And they lead to, to delusion of otherwise highly intelligent people. So what I'm talking about here especially applies to highly intelligent people. Because, see, in their hubris, highly intelligent people um, assume they understand all this stuff already when uh, they don't. 
And then that, that just makes it even worse. So you've got layer upon layer upon layer of self-deception going on here, which is why we need to spend all this time really talking about the examples, going through them in a lot of detail over and over again so you start to see the significance of this. All right, so you might say, okay, Leo, so what do I do about this? What is required to see my own positions? How does the eye see itself? Well, basically three things. Awareness, raising your awareness. There's a lot of ways you can do that, which I've talked about in the past, from meditation to mindfulness practice to many, many other things. Also, though, self-honesty. Developing the capacity to be more self-honest. And objectivity. Developing the capacity to look at situations, including yourself, and not giving yourself any special privileged position. So first what you want to do is you want to acknowledge your positions as positions as much as you can. Acknowledge your perspectives as perspectives and not as absolutes. Super important. Don't engage in debates with people where you start to defend yourself based on this bogus notion of certain positions as being self-evident and default, and then playing this game of burden of proof. It's like, well, you have to provide burden of proof to change my mind. Don't do that. Instead, be much more honest and to just say, yeah, you know, this is my position. I'm an atheist, and that's my position. And I believe that after death, there will be nothingness, and that's my position. I believe that reality is real, and that's a position that I hold. And there could be alternatives. But see, the whole game that the mind is playing with itself is that it's trying to close down possibilities for alternatives. That's why the mind doesn't generally like to hear this stuff, much less actually work to implement it. Be very vigilant with yourself. Watch yourself like a hawk. And just stop giving your beliefs special status. Watch how you will attack and criticize everybody else's beliefs. And then when it comes to your own beliefs, you'll be like, ah, oh, it's okay, I'll just let myself slide a little bit. It's okay, we'll just fudge some stuff here and fudge some stuff there. No, you got to apply the same rigorous standard of criticism to yourself as you do to all the other silly nonsense beliefs that you find out in the world. And then what you'll discover is that actually you're part of them and that there's no real difference at all. And then that's what gives you the motivation to then step outside the whole game and then play this game on a whole different level. Now you're really exiting the dogmatic paradigm and you're entering the uh, non-duality paradigm at that point. And non-duality is actually not a paradigm. Ironically, it might seem like what I'm saying here is that everything is relative. You know, everything's just open to speculation. You can just, anything goes, it all comes out in a wash, it doesn't matter what you believe, everything is equal. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Actually, this relativism, which sounds like relativism, will come full circle and it will turn into the absolute. And you will arrive at the absolute. But the absolute will not be anything like you think from your dogmatic uh, you know, um, relative perspectives, because it's the absolute. It's not a perspective. You can't squeeze the absolute into your perspective. But that's, <laughs> that's a discussion for another time. So in conclusion, I just want to tell you to be very suspicious of any ideologies that limit your ability to observe. Because observation here is the key. The key to raising awareness is observation. That's basically what awareness is. It's just observation. But most people don't want to engage in observation. They want to engage in uh, position taking. Observation is very threatening to the mind. That's why it, it refuses to observe. It's very stubborn about observation. It'll only want to observe the things that really uh, perpetuate 
its survival and its current web of beliefs. And it doesn't want to observe the stuff that runs contrary to that. And then that gets us into a lot of trouble. All right, that's it. I'm done here. I'm signing off. Please uh, click the like button for me. Post your comments down below. Um, come check out actualize.org as well. This is my website right here. I've got my blog. I'm releasing new stuff on my blog all the time. I've got my life purpose course, the book list, the forum. There's a lot of resources. Come check it all out. Most of it is free. And stick with me for more. You might think that, oh, well, Leo, you've already covered so many topics and all the important topics, it sounds like you've already covered and you're just like rehashing stuff over and over again. No, 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 no. More foundational topics are coming. Completely new stuff that you haven't heard about before. It's on the way. I have lists, lists of hundreds of episodes that I need to shoot. But um, if it sometimes seems like I'm rehashing stuff, I'm actually very cognizant not to waste your time repeating the same things in new episodes. If, uh, if, if it seems that way, it seems like there's overlap, it's because that overlap is either natural and organic to this assembling of the big picture, or it's because it really needs to be stressed for you to get it, right? Um, one of the dangers with shooting these videos with no overlap, which is actually what I try to do, no overlap between episodes, is that that means that if you miss an episode, a foundational episode, you don't watch it, that means you have like a huge missing gap in your understanding of reality and life. And so the burden is then on you to make sure that you watch all the episodes and piece it all together. Um, so sometimes there's gonna be some overlap between certain concepts. For example, you might think like, well, Default positions, how are they really different from paradigms? Uh, there's a lot of overlap there, true. But also, I want you to have that, that label of default position. I want you to have that concept in your mind with all the associated examples so that in the future when I talk about default positions, you can be like, oh yeah, that's it, and that's it, and that's it, and I can see how it all interconnects. See, so th this process of interconnecting everything, which is what is my deepest passion here, is to give you a really integrated, biggest picture possible understanding of yourself and of life. Um, that's challenging to do. And very few teachers or people out there do it because um, it really requires you to stretch your mind. And then it also requires you to spend quite a bit of time putting all the puzzle pieces together. See? But... Um, Man, having that big picture understanding of life is incredible. It's incredible. It's the most amazing thing. It's the, it's the thing that I'm the most passionate about in life is getting this big picture understanding. And uh, I'm really excited to give you more of the foundational building blocks in the future to do just that. So stick with me for more.